Thanks for joining us today for Sunday School. Glad that you've decided to click on this and watch this. And uh, we're in the middle of a series talking about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for joining me today. I'm glad that you decided to click on this and watch Sunday School, and uh, glad that you have taken the time to do this. And we are in the middle, we're finishing up this week, actually looking at a series called The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And uh, we've looked at, first of all, Moses, how God appeared to Moses and identified himself as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Then we've looked at Abraham, known as the father of the faithful, and he had many times that he was not faithful, uh, yet God still used him. We looked at Isaac last week, and we looked at the various fears present in his life, yet God was still uh, willing to use him. And this week, we're going to take a look at the life of Jacob. And uh, before we get started, I'd ask you to join with me in prayer that God would lead us and guide us today. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for today, for this privilege to hear your word, Lord, to learn about you, learn about your word. And I pray that your word would be a light to us today, Lord, that it would reveal what it needs to in our heart, that it would uh, do the work that it's intended to do, God. We believe you and trust you for what you want to speak to us. We give you praise and honor and glory for it. In Jesus' name, amen. So this week, looking at the life of Jacob, uh, the idea is that just as God brought about a change in Jacob's life, God desires to empower us to rise above the failures in our own lives. So this week we're looking at the life of Jacob and really looking at how he, was, he had many failures in his life, and yet God was still able to use him. And we turn to Genesis chapter 35, verses 6 and 7 this morning. It says, So Jacob came to Luz, that is Bethel, which is in the land of Canaan, he and all the people who were with him, and he built an altar there and called the place El Bethel, because there God appeared to him when he fled from the face of his brother. Jacob was used to living a comfortable life in tents. It was his brother Esau who enjoyed roughing it in the field and hunting game. Looking around at the barren rocky ground of his campsite, Jacob had never felt further from home or more alone than he did at that moment. There were no thick carpets, no warm blankets, no plush pillows. There were no servants, and there was little or no food. He had little concept of how to really even make a proper camp. The best he could do was find a relatively smooth stone, decide that would be his pillow. Somehow, perhaps by the exhaustion of his fear-filled flight from his brother Esau, Jacob managed to fall asleep on that rocky pillow. He dreamed as he slept that he was at the foot of a ladder set on earth, but with nothing to lean on, and his eyes followed the rungs up and up into the heavens, and there were angels descending and then ascending again on the ladder until the entire ladder was covered with the glowing beams. His eyes were drawn ever higher to a figure standing above the ladder, shining like the sun. The shining figure spoke and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, thy father, and the God of Isaac. The land whereon thou liest to give thee, to thee will I give it into thy seed, and thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in thee and in, in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And behold, I am with thee, and will keep thee in all places whither thou goest, and will bring thee again into this land, for I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to thee. With the start, Jacob's eyes flew open, and he states in Genesis 28, the following verses, he says, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. His heart was pounding with sudden fear. He said, How dreadful is this place? This is none other but the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. Jacob rose with the first light of dawn, and he took the stone that he had used as a pillow and set it up as a pillar, digging into his uh, what he had of supplies, he found some oil and poured it over the pillar, and he would call this place Bethel, the house of God. And there in the house of God, Jacob makes a tentative covenant or promise with God in Genesis 28, verse 20. It says, If God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on, 
so that I come again to my father's house in peace. Then shall the Lord be my God, and this stone which I have set for a pillar shall be God's house. And all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give the tenth unto thee. It didn't seem to strike Jacob as odd to place so many conditions on God. The God who had graced his dreams and extended an incredible promise to him. And really, Jacob was still working an angle. He was still seeking his own comfort and advancement as he always had. But time would bring him full circle back to Bethel. But he had a lot of growing to do still. From birth, Jacob's life was colored by negative expectations. First of all, he was named Jacob, which meant supplanter or deceiver. Genesis 25, 25 tells us that, and that even as Jacob and Esau wrestled in the womb of their mother, Rebekah, God had foretold that the older would serve the younger. On the day they were born, Esau was born first, then Jacob was born as he grabbed Esau's heel. And in that time, and in many societies still, names mean something. They can almost determine destiny or uh, naming a child happens just a little bit later. And so uh, Jacob, or Isaac and Rebecca, they watched these boys and they tried to pick names that would suit the character of these boys. Esau was named because uh, Esau means red and his wasn't a character. It was how he actually looked. He was he was he had red hair and was hairy all over. So they called him red. As for Jacob, because he grabbed his brother's heel, his parents named him Jacob, meaning supplanter or deceiver. And he was the one that was expected to try and trip his brother. In fact, from the prophecy that was given, they knew that somehow the younger would take over. So they knew that there would be something happening. And there were these negative expectations. Imagine if you called your child deceiver. That's a pretty negative connotation, whether you believe that the name defines you or not. You still probably wouldn't like to be called that. And so there was this expectation uh, that really Jacob would live down to. And I know many times in our life it may not be a name, but there are expectations that weigh upon us that, that perhaps because of our background or family or, or past mistakes, there are expectations. And really, a lot of times when we're talking in this context, we're not talking about living up to expectations. We're talking about living down to expectations. And many times because of those things, because of, of people's uh, low view of us, uh, because of whatever reason, we tend to live down to those expectations. But this lesson is not talking about that. It's talking about how we need to rise above those negative expectations. We also find that there was an odd family dynamic, that favoritism within the family drove a wedge in Jacob's, uh, in, in the family of Isaac and Jacob. Esau was the favorite son of Isaac. Uh, Esau loved to hunt, and he would bring in fresh meat, and he would cook it, and he knew just how his father Isaac liked it. And so he, Esau was the favorite of Isaac. On the other hand, Rebekah loved Jacob because he would be with her and help her in the tent. Whatever she was doing, he would be there to help her. He would help her cook. He would help her do whatever else. Um, and so uh, he became, Jacob became the favorite of Rebekah. So there's a split in the family. Isaac loved, loves Esau and Rebekah loves uh, Jacob. And so there was this unusual dynamic that there was a very clear delineation of who was whose favorite. So we have all these expectations, being called a deceiver, being uh, uh, the family dynamic split like it was, that kind of puts Jacob on this course. And Jacob lived up to his parents' negative expectations. He lived up to his name. One day Jacob was cooking lentils when Esau returned from hunting. And after a long day of hunting, Esau was starving. I don't know if you've ever come in. I, I, there's probably very few people who are watching this that have ever literally been starving, but you get to that point where you're so hungry, you say, I'm starving. And Esau shows up starving. And he asks Jacob for some of the stew that he is making. And in that moment, Jacob lowers himself to his name and he sees an opportunity and he says, I'll give you a bowl of stew if you'll give me your birthright. Esau, of course, there's problems with Esau. He should never have traded his birthright for something so uh, uh, temporary as a bowl of food, but he does. And he, Jacob uses whatever leverage he could to advance himself. To he, He's not afraid of deception or, or bartering or trying to. And, and really, he's living up or living down to the expectations of what people thought of him. Again, this happens to you and I many times that we live down to these expectations. Now, imagine your father is old and blind and everyone expects him to die at any moment. 
So he calls for the older brother, Esau, the hunter, and he asks him to go and shoot him one last deer to prepare one last meal for him. That, at that meal, everyone knows that Isaac is going to give uh, the larger portion of the inheritance to Esau. He's only older by a few minutes, but he is still the firstborn. And so Rebekah calls Jacob, and together they hatch a plot. And in this plot, Jacob decides, or they decide together to impersonate Esau. They put on his clothes to make him smell like Esau. They put animal skins on his arms and neck so he's hairy like him. And they're going to fix meat with the same spices that Esau always uses. And so Jacob goes into his blind old father on his deathbed and lies to his face. Jacob goes in and tells him that he's his brother Esau. And Isaac begins to doubt. He begins to question. And yet Jacob just lies more. He, elab he creates a more elaborate lie. And he ends up stealing his brother's inheritance. He has his birthright and his inheritance now. That's pretty low to go into your dying father and deceive your father the, the, those last few moments. But this is exactly what Jacob did. And Esau comes in. He finds out what's happened. And of course, he's, he's furious. He says in Genesis 27, Is not he rightly named Jacob? For he has supplanted me these two times. He took away my birthright, and now he hath taken away my blessing. He says, isn't that the perfect name for Jacob? He is a deceiver, and that is his name. And Esau threw Jacob's name in his face. As far as Esau was concerned, Jacob had done nothing but turn out as bad as everyone expected him to. And there are people that the reason you make decisions that you do, the reason that you make choices that you do and, and, and pursue the actions that you do is because nobody expects anything of you. In fact, they expect worse of you. And, and many times we allow that to control and dictate more than we even realize in our lives. But we find that at Bethel, Jacob had hit rock bottom, but God was there. Despite Rebecca's insistence and even his own inclinations, Jacob had been hesitant to deceive his father. He had feared a curse instead of a blessing, yet even after Jacob stole Esau's blessing, Isaac blessed Jacob again before he sent him to Haran. Receiving good for evil must have weighed on Jacob's mind because even after Isaac knew Jacob had deceived him, he still gave him a blessing. Why would his father do this after he knew what had happened? How could his father Isaac be so selfless when Jacob himself had been so selfish in his deception? And just think about this again. Jacob, it wasn't just a deception. Jacob probably thought that his father was dying, and he was. And he didn't know if he would ever see him again. And, and one of his last acts that he would ever do, the last words he ever spoke to his father, were deception and lies. At this moment, Esau is furious, and so Jacob runs for his life. He just runs with whatever he can grab. Esau comforted himself over this deception of Jacob. He said, as soon as my father dies, I'm going to kill Jacob for what he's done. Jacob flees and he goes to Haran where uh, under the pretext of finding a wife and this, he has an uncle there. But he goes from being the second son of a wealthy landowner or chieftain to being a homeless, penniless vagabond. He goes from the comfort of the tent to where we read he has just a stone pillow. Jacob had literally hit rock bottom, if you would. But at that point of the lowest of lows, where his own family seeks to kill him now, those who should have been his supporters and closest to him now seek to kill him, God amazingly gives Jacob a vision at Bethel and offers him a covenant as well. He's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God makes a covenant, renews a covenant with each of them. Jacob sees this vision. He saw the vision of a ladder and angels and God above and God gave Jacob the same covenant he had made with Abraham and Isaac, which is really astounding when you think of it, that why, why would God do that? Jacob was the lowest of the low. He lied to his dying father. He deceived throughout his life, and he's at the lowest point running from his own family, not running from enemies, but he has made his enemies of his family, and, and he's running from his own family. Yet God met him there in the lowest point. I'm thankful that God is not just the God uh, uh, of, the, of the righteous. He's not just the God of the saintly. He's not just the God of the brightest people, but he is the God of those who mess up. He is the God of those who fail. He is the God of sinners. He is the God of cheaters and liars. He is the God of the flawed and the failures. He is the God, really, and here's, here's who he is the God of. He is the God of who will, whosoever will come to him. 
It doesn't matter what state they're in, as long as they are willing to come, he will be your God. And at the lowest point in your life, just like Jacob, God is there. I want to tell someone today that is in, you're in a low point. Uh, it may not be the lowest point of your life, or it may be, but you are in a low point. God reaches down to the lowest points. David says, when I make my bed in hell, you are still there, God. I'm here to, to remind you today that it doesn't matter what state you're in or even why you got there. God is the God of the low moments too. So we find that God appears to Jacob and Jacob accepted the covenant, but with conditions. <laughs> Jacob's first reaction was amazement. He was kind of almost oblivious to God's presence. Sometimes that happens to us, but then his second reaction was fear. He says, how dreadful is this place? When you're not right with God, sometimes this is the natural reaction to his presence. When, when, when you know things aren't right, you begin to think, man, this is a dreadful place. But what Jacob does next is pretty, it's a lesson to us. It doesn't get much worse for him. He's got a stone for a pillow. But Jacob, he has this vision and he takes those stones that signify the lowest of lows. And he turns them into an altar. He takes the situation he's in right then and makes it a place of worship and an altar. And I want to challenge you that whatever you're facing right now, you can make an altar in that place. I know it may not seem perfect. I know it may not seem like everything that you need, but what Jacob needed to make an altar was a stone, and he had a stone. Let me tell you, what you need uh, in whatever situation you're in, what you need is a heart that's willing to turn towards God. That's all you need. It doesn't have to be perfect. Your situation doesn't have to be perfect. Your mind doesn't even have to be completely in the right place. You need a heart that is willing to turn towards God. And if you have that, you can say, Lord, I'm willing to give you this situation, this circumstance. And then you make a decision that says, despite what's going on, despite what it may look like, still I'm going to worship. Still I'm going to praise you. Still I will serve you. This there, It may look barren and, and empty right now, but I'm declaring just like Jacob did that this is the house of God. Let me tell you that you can make any place a house of God through your worship and commitment to him. It doesn't matter how low, how far down you've gone. You can make any place a place of God. We find, though, that Jacob next tried to barter with God. He said, if God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then shall the Lord be my God. And man, this seems really presumptuous on Jacob's part. He's, he's at the lowest point and he's still trying to bargain with God. But notice that God did not withdraw. He had a plan. He had a purpose. And even though Jacob was still doing things wrong, even as he committed to God, it was the fact that he was willing to turn towards God and God stuck with him. God knew that Jacob had a long way to go, but he honored the desire of the first step. Let me tell you, God honors the desire of your first step. Don't discount a small step. Scripture says, don't despise the day of small things. And all this is, is a small thing that Jacob did. He turned towards God. He still had baggage, trouble, failures, uh, all kind of, uh, of character issues he had to work out. He was still a liar at this point, but he took that first step towards God. Let me challenge you today. Take that first step towards God in your situation. God protected Jacob and brought him back to Canaan safely and God protected Jacob from the scheming of Laban as well. Jacob was fleeing to his uncle Laban and Haran, and there God blessed him. Jacob earned cattle, was married, had children. However, he also was deceived during this time. The deceiver was deceived, and he ended up uh, working for Laban twice as long, trying to get the wife that he wanted. Laban tried to cheat Jacob of his wages many times. But God was with Jacob and brought all of Laban's plots to nothing. God is working on his behalf. Even when Jacob thought he was the one that was, uh, was smart enough to cheat Laban, it was really God's blessings that were prospering him. I think that's important to remember too that uh, even though Jacob has turned towards God, he's still working his own plans. But never forget that it's the blessings of God that prosper you, not your own plans. God blesses us many times in spite of us still trying to figure it out, still trying to work it out, still trying to make a way. Finally, we find Jacob slipping away from Laban and he heads back to Canaan. Laban pursues Jacob and God met Laban and rebuked him and, and, and God delivered Jacob from Laban. As Jacob traveled back towards Canaan, he's traveling back towards, he knows that he's going to encounter his brother. The last he's heard of his brother, his brother has said, I'm going to kill him. 
So he sends messengers ahead to speak to Esau. They returned saying Esau was coming to meet Jacob accompanied by 400 men. This doesn't sound very good. Jacob had the same fear. He didn't think, man, he didn't, he was worried now. He thought he's coming with 400 men to kill me and everything that I have. So Jacob divides his family into two bands. He's expecting one of them to be destroyed. Then he sends Esau a gift trying to appease him. And on that most desperate night of his life, the night before he is going to cross the river back into Canaan, Jacob sends his, everything that he has, all of his family ahead. And finally, it's him alone one more time. And in that night, that night that he was alone, God met Jacob again. And it's in this story that God wrestles with him and God changes his name. As the day broke, God ordered Jacob to let him go. They're wrestling and some people say it was an angel or whatever it was. It, it, was, it was from God or was God. And Jacob wrestles all night. Comes morning and Jacob will not let go. He says, I will not let you go unless you bless me. He's had all these blessings, yet he still wants another blessing. What is your name, God asked. God knew what his name was. <laughs> but he wanted Jacob to face what he was. Let me tell you, you always have to face who you are before God will change you. You've got to acknowledge who you are. That's from the very moment of repentance. You have to acknowledge that you are a sinner before God can forgive you. And many times in moments after in our life, we have to acknowledge and confront and face who we are before God will ever change us. I think that this is part of humility. That when I am humble enough to say, this is who I am, Jacob has to say, I'm a liar. And that could be difficult, especially when you've walked with God for a while and you think, man, I should be this, I should be that. But God still calls us to evaluate and identify things that are wrong in our life. And it can be hard for you to say, even though I'm doing all this, I'm, I still have pride in my life. I still have this issue in my life. But before God can change it, we need to identify what it is. So Jacob replies to God. He says, Jacob, think about what it means. God said, what's your name? And Jacob said, deceiver. That's who I am. That's my identity. That's been my track record the whole time. Look at my life. Look at the failures. Look at the fall, uh, uh, the, the, all the falls that I've had all my faults and all my flaws. This is who I am. I'm a deceiver. And God said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. God tells him, I'm going to transform you from a deceiver to a prince who has power with God. God is the God of failures. And God wants to change your name too. Now, I want you to notice as well, this is interesting, that Jacob says, God, I'm not going to let you go. I'm re I've wrestled all night. I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. There, look at the situation and the circumstance. I don't know exactly what Jacob thought when he said, I, I want you to bless me. But I'll just put myself in that situation where I'm about to face my brother who I haven't seen for years. And the last words that I heard from him were, I'm going to kill you. And I've sent all my family, all my goods, all my possessions across the river. And I know in the morning I'm going to face my brother. I'm going to face the situation that has dogged me for years. And I, and I don't know about Jacob, but this is me. This is what I would mean when I say, God, I want you to bless me. I'll tell you what would be in my mind is God save me from this situation. I need your blessing. Lord, give me favor. Uh, you know, close his eyes, change Esau's mind, do something. But deliver me from this situation. I need that blessing. I mean, he's been delivered when he ran. He got away from Esau the first time. God has blessed him by delivering from the hand of, uh, of Haran, or Laban, sorry. He's delivered him from the hand of Laban. And so I can see uh, Jacob thinking this way as well of, God, get me out of this situation because he spent his whole life trying to get out of situations. But let me tell you what God does. He does not get him out of the situation. He changes who he is. Sometimes what we, what we need is not the situation to change, but we need to change. And the situation will change because we are different. Too many times we want the blessing and God is trying to change our identity, our, our, our destiny really, because he wants to change our name. Let me tell you that you're trying to, you're, you're thinking too small. 
that God wants to change who you are. He doesn't want to just fix another mess up that you've created. He wants to change who you are. That There are people out there, you're watching this right now, and you've got a, you've got a track record of mistakes, of doing the same thing again and, and, and living down to people's expectations. God wants to change your name from a deceiver to a prince who has power with God. He wants to take, take you from someone who perpetually does the same thing and change you to someone who has a new destiny, a new identity. He wants you to be known by a different name from this point forward. God is looking to do that in you. And I know your name may not physically change, but spiritually your name may change of someone who goes from doubt to faith, of someone who goes from, from uh, depression to joy, of someone who goes uh, that has bitterness in their heart to someone who demonstrates love everywhere. And it's not, it's not that God has changed the situation, but you, be, through God, can change your situation because he has changed you. That's what God did to Jacob and he wants to do in your life as well. So we find that Jacob finds favor in the sight of Esau. I believe it's because he was different. And Esau brings him back to Bethel. Jacob's gift and humility, and I believe his identity, they change the whole situation, the whole dynamic. Esau and Jacob part on good terms when we go back to the verses we read at the start. Genesis 35, verse 6, is, verse six and 7. So Jacob came to Luz, which is the land of Canaan, that is Bethel. God brought him back to the place. It was presumptuous at the start, but God still brought him back. He and all the people that were with him, and he built there an altar and called the place El Bethel, because there God appeared unto him when he fled from the face of his brother. And then skipping down to verse 11 through 15, and God said unto him, I am God Almighty, be fruitful and multiply a nation, and a company of nations shall be of thee, and kings shall come out of thy loins, and the land which I gave Abraham and Isaac to thee, I will give it into thy seed, after thee I will give the land. And God went up from him in the place where he talked with him. And Jacob set up a pillar in the place where he talked with him, even a pillar of stone, and he poured a drink offering thereon. And he poured oil on it, and Jacob called the name of the place where God spake with him, Bethel. Let me tell you, God will bring you back to a place of covenant, to a place of promise, to a place of destiny, a place you never imagined. If you're willing to let him change you, change your name. Peter was just a fisherman until Jesus came and said, follow me. He was, he was bold and brave, quick to speak, quick to speak up and quick to speak out. He was the one who first said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus gave Peter the keys to the kingdom to unlock the door of salvation. He was Jesus' right-hand man, if you would. Yet, Peter failed repeatedly. Peter was walking on the water, but then he looked at the waves. He heard Jesus tell of his death, and Peter rebuked Jesus, not, not speaking out. But Jesus said, get thee behind me, Satan. When Jesus calls you Satan, that's pretty rough. In Gethsemane, Jesus begged Peter to watch and pray with him for an hour. But instead, Peter fell asleep. Jesus was sweating. Scripture says, as it were, great drops of blood and anguish of spirit. And Peter was asleep. When Peter did wake up, he found soldiers and men had come to arrest Jesus. And Peter was so out of touch with the fact that this was God's plan. He tried to fight off the men, drew a sword. He swings wildly and he cuts off a man's ear and Jesus healed the man and told Peter, quit fighting, put your sword away. Peter, who said he would die before he would deny Jesus, he lost his nerve and he fled, he ran. Then Peter, he snuck into the high priest's palace to watch from afar and as Jesus went through the, the trial that he was going through as he was blindfolded, slapped, falsely accused and, and, and condemned, Peter was out warming himself by the fire. Someone sees him and accuses him of being a disciple, and Peter denied it. Others insisted that he must be a disciple, and he began to curse and swear, saying, I don't know this man. And then the cock crows, the rooster crows. That moment, Jesus turned and looked at Peter, and Peter remembers the words of Jesus when he said, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter goes out and weeps bitterly as he remembers those words. Yet after his resurrection, Jesus made it a point to specifically search out Peter. He replicated the miracle of the net full of fish he had performed the day he first called Peter. Then on the shore, Jesus asked Peter three times. Peter had denied three times. Jesus asked him three times, Simon, do you love me? Notice he says, Simon, do you love me? Jesus restored Peter because he still had a plan for him. He uses that term Simon of the old man, but now he, he wants to call him Peter because he's going to be a rock. He changed his name. 
He still had a plan for him. Despite his failures, Peter still held the keys. And on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, it was Peter who unlocked the door of salvation through his preaching. It was Peter who unlocked the door in Samaria. It was Peter who unlocked the door to the Gentiles in Cornelius' house. This one-time failure unlocked the door for every one of us to receive salvation, proving that regardless of their failures, anyone can enter into the will and purpose of God. I want to read one verse from Proverbs chapter 24, verse 16. In verse 17, for a righteous man may fall seven times and rise again, but the wicked shall fall by calamity. Sorry, just verse 16. It says the righteous man may fall seven times and rise again, but the wicked shall fall by calamity. Notice there's a distinction there between the righteous and the foolish or the wicked. The distinction is not that they fall. The distinction is that when he talks about the righteous man falling, he says he will get back up. We don't find the wicked man getting back up. Let me tell you, it doesn't matter your failures, faults. It doesn't matter if you have a track record, if you have a list you can pull out of everything you've done wrong. The definition of the righteous man is the one who gets back up. As long as you're willing to get back up, even if it's like Jacob that first time when he's fleeing for his life and you give, law, you give God a list of all these things that you expect, he was getting back up. God will respond to the person who gets back up. Let me tell you, your ministry is not dependent upon how good you are. It's dependent upon how many times you can get back up. Your walk with God is not dependent upon whether you're going to fail God or not, because you probably will. You probably will mess up. It is all dependent upon whether you are willing to get back up. Let me tell you, the enemy has a low expectation of you. And when he comes in to lie and deceive to you, he wants to tell you, you can't get back up from this. You can't. Don't live down to the enemy's view of you. Live up to God's expectation that you are more than a conqueror, that you can get back up, that God can still use you. He is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Your faith may fail, but God can use you. Fears may arise, but God can use you. Failures may be your track record, but God can change your name and use you for his kingdom. I pray this has been a blessing to you, and I want us to pray in closing that God would seal this word inside of us. Lord Jesus, we come before you thankful for your word, thankful that you use imperfect people, that you use people that fail, that mess up, that have a history. They, their very name suggests that they are a failure and a mess up, but God, you can still come in. You can begin to move and work, and Lord, you can change the identity and destiny of people, and Lord. I'm challenge, I, I want to pray a challenge into people's hearts that if they are willing to just get back up one more time, that you will be faithful and true to meet them there. I believe you and trust you and thank you for your faithfulness, your promise, your covenant you still give to us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I pray this lesson, this series has been a blessing to you and I encourage you. Uh, it doesn't matter what's going on in your life. God can still use you. Just read the Bible. You'll find it full of imperfect people that God continues to use. I, I pray it's been a blessing, and uh, God bless you. Thank you for watching this Sunday School lesson this morning.